<laughs> Blake Wheeler has improved so dramatically as a National Hockey League player. Uh, I had him with the U.S. program, and I remember I had him in the World Championships one year, and I said, you're the most improved American player in the NHL. A year later, I told him, I take that back. You're the most improved player in the National Hockey League. And we use Blake Wheeler in Calgary as an example to our scouting staff of not having preconceived opinions of a player that, that just ironclad. Because Blake Wheeler, everything in his draft year said soft skill. Like good player, skilled, tall, but soft. No physical side. He's developed a f- complete physical game. Mm-hmm. Like he, he checks people, he, he battles for pucks, he wins battles consistently. So we used him as an example to our staff. Here's a leopard that changed its spots. This can happen. A player can get meaner. He can get tougher. He can get better. And he's got leadership skills. If he played anywhere besides Winnipeg, they would be talking about him for all these things. He's right. So you're, what you're trying to tell me now is that even though I showed my boo-boo on national television, I can get tougher and yes. I can get stronger just like Shape Blake Wheeler did Do you know what, in when I, Winnipeg. When I did discipline for the <laughs> National Hockey yeah. League, we had an agreement with the NHLPA that anything less than 10 stitches was considered a shaving cut. <laughs> so a guy, I remember Peter Forsberg got slashed by Billy Guerin. It was actually got chopped on the arm and it clipped him. Mm-hmm. He got six stitches. And I remember arguing with Pierre Lacroix, who's the GM of Colorado. I said, it's a shaving cut, for God's sake. There's six stitches in his cheek, so we have a little different standard. <laughs> My brother's going to be very happy about that because he once stuck me for six stitches right below the chin, and I hold it against him to this since, day. To this sure. day, and now he's got this, that it's a shaving, shaving cut. cut. He's going to take, take that line and run with it. Yeah, he is. Speak, well, since we're on the topic of, of player discipline, and, and you, you've been in that seat, we haven't, but you've been there, the, uh, the Kyle Pozo Travis Dermott the other night. Yeah. What did you make of it? Two-minute penalty at most. It's not a suspension. I, this is where working in Canada amuses me sometimes. The passion for the game is wonderful. It makes it special to live and work here. People love this game. But the irrationality that accompanies that, why is he watching his pass? Who does this? There's a large player coming at high speed, and you watch and admire this nice little pass you make behind the net. Now, a player who exposed himself, it's not green light, fair game, whatever. But Kyle just finishes his check there. I don't think it's overly violent. He doesn't leave his feet. So, to me, it's a two-minute boarding penalty. It's not a suspension. The, but in uh, Toronto, they, they, wanna, they want this guy to get 20 games. It's crazy. Right. Well, I think a lot of people are like, we don't want skilled players to have to watch their – and listen, I'm, I'm not part of this group. I said the same thing as you, but the argument would be if I'm going to play – Yeah, but Kyle's was, a skilled player too. So, I mean, it's not like he got right. some thug hit him. He got hit by a good player. He won't do it again. I can promise you Travis Dermott will not watch his pass again. Right. Okay, let's move on because you, you mentioned uh, the hysteria in this country. You've worked in the lower mainland. Yep. And over the last little while after this 9-3 nine and, three, nine and, three and three start, they have become panicked. And there have been fingers being pointed. Yep. There's been a bunch of injuries, although there are other teams dealing with similar injuries right. that are playing very well right now, including the Bruins, including the Pittsburgh Penguins, including the Winnipeg Jets. But where, what do you see in Vancouver, and do you think the hysteria or the panic right now that is setting in is warranted, or is this team going to be better in the long term? Well, first off, I, I think the panic in Vancouver from – I worked there for 13 years, I guess it was, and uh, lived there for 13 years, worked there for 12. And so I was uh, – doing my math is lousy here. I worked there 11, lived there 12. So I was assistant GM for five years, then GM for six years. The panic is a very small number. The, 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 the vast majority of fans in Vancouver are fantastic and loyal and knowledgeable. There is this lunatic fringe that panics hysterically at the first sign of adversity. So what I would say to them is there's, there's no question the team's having trouble right now. But to blame Travis Green for that to me makes no sense. And if you look at Jim Benning, and this is a problem. So they say they haven't made the, the playoffs in this many years. So I remember coming to Toronto, and they're like, we haven't won a cup since 1967. And I said, I just got here. Right. My <laughs> clock starts in 2008. Right. I don't care that your clock has 25 years on it already. That's not my clock. My clock starts today. I can only repair what I can do from this day forward. And if you look at the young players that Jim Benning's brought in, and Travis Green is clearly well-liked by his, his team. He's a popular coach. He's a player's coach. 
He played for me in Anaheim. He's a good guy. Uh, Pod Colson is coming. The, one of their top prospects isn't even here yet. He's playing in Russia. So I think some patience is warranted. Uh, but this is Canada and particularly Vancouver. You win three, and they are measuring the streets in front of the arena to see if the floats <laughs> will all fit. Yeah. You lose three, and they want to fire the coach. It doesn't make any sense. Right. When you were a GM, regardless of the market in this country, because in my mind, someone like you in your position – I don't know about the younger GMs today, but someone like you wouldn't pay attention to talk radio, wouldn't pay attention to the papers, wouldn't pay attention to any of that stuff. Did you no. at any point? No. Even if someone said, Berkey, you got su- such and such wrote this, you got to see this, would you still not well, touch it? People forward really bad stuff to me. So, like, I was in Afghanistan on July 1st visiting the Canadian soldiers for Canada Day, and we didn't sign Brad Richards. And Steve Simmons, who I can't stand, ripped me for not being in – Toronto on July 1st to sign Brad Richards. And I think we offered Brad Richards six times six, six years at six million. And the agents said, no, really? Like, really? What, what, what will you pay him? And I think we might have gone to six times seven, 42. He signed for $63 million. And they bought him out of that contract two or three years later. So we did the right thing. We didn't step up. We didn't overspend. We didn't overcommit. And that someone faxed to me because I was in Afghanistan and someone emailed me and said, you're not going to believe you just got ripped for being overseas in a war zone visiting Canadian soldiers. So people will send you really offensive stuff so you're aware of a little of it, but you don't read it. I remember a columnist from the Toronto Star came in my office one day and he said, I know you say that you don't listen to us, but I know you do. I said, come here. Outside, my assistant, Catherine Gray, every day they bring the clips. So the national clips and the Toronto clips, and they're dated. Someone writes a date on them. I said, you go through that pile. It's about this high. That's probably 10 days' worth of clips. You find one day that's missing from there. One day that I read either set of clips, and I'll apologize. And I said, you know what happens when the pile gets too high? I grabbed the recycling bin, and I shoved it all into the bin. And I'm like, that's what I think you're writing. <laughs> he was not happy. <laughs> not happy. you got to tune that out. If you work in Canada, you, and Pat Quinn's the one who taught me this. Yeah. He ignored it all. You got to ignore it. You got. You can't listen to the white noise. There's too many. There's 80 people or 90 people in the dressing room after a game. Yeah. So when the Leafs lose, everyone picks up a rock. So for when I was here, it was 10 at me and 10 at Ronnie Wilson and 10 at Phil Kessel and 10 at Dion. But it's a steady volume of 80 or 90 rocks every loss. In Calgary, there's only 30 people in that room after a game, and they generally want the team to do well. So they'll throw a few rocks, but it, it ain't 80 rocks. Right. It might be five. So it's very different here. It's the volume here that, that, that wears people out. Yeah, and that's what it is, right? It wears you down. Like, you can yeah, say that I'm not it's, listening, it, I'm not here, but it, eventually it's just, it's like... Well, and social media accelerates. Away at a rock. I felt when I got here in 2008, I felt social media was out of touch with our fans. I thought our fans really loved the team and wanted it to do well, and social media was out of... By the time I left, I felt they were in lockstep. The social media had influenced the really? main, mainstream media so much that they were in lockstep. But you're stuck with that. You're stuck with, with both sides of the media. The vast majority of the people who work in the media are good people that try to get it right, and they're honest, and they're, they're smart, and they want to get it right. It's a handful that just make it hell for general managers and coaches, and they accelerate the lunatic fringe in the social media. Do you want more on that? Because this, this is interesting to let's me. Go, let's, let's go down this road, yeah. But I, I wanted to ask a different way, a similar question, though. I heard Dave Tippett say something interesting after last night's game. Uh, he was talking about the Blues' ability to win puck battles. And he said, if you're not willing to engage, you're going to lose. And then he added, we try sometimes. I heard it. I know fans hear that. Do the players hear something like that from their head coach? Yeah, or that's it- different. You, when you're a player, you listen to what the coach says publicly. You do? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's, that's not white noise. That's your coach. Yeah. But he's not talking to you. No, but he, well, he is talking kind to me. <laughs> He's using that medium to right. get to me. But, uh, and, and he was right. Like, what, uh, people say you shouldn't dump on your players, but I saw that comment, and I thought, he's right. They don't try to win those battles all the time. Uh, they're getting better at it. They're, I mean, they're a great story. Everyone thought they'd be terrible this year, and here they are in a playoff position. They're a great story. But they're struggling a little bit now, and, and they're wasting good goaltending. You cannot waste goaltending like they've gotten. That's my complaint with the Canucks. They're getting superb goaltending, and they're not getting anything out of it. When your goalie plays that well, you've got to find a way to manufacture some points. 
And that's the problem in Edmonton the last little bit. Koskinen's been out of his mind, and they still lost, what, three in a row or yeah. one out of the last – they won one game out of their last yeah, four. won the last game. But I still – they're still a great story to me. They're still – you know, they've got two of the best players in the game that they're exciting to watch. Problem is so much of their offense is being driven by two guys that when they're off or when they have a slow night – uh, the team can't manufacture any offense around it. And that would be the most exciting part for the Leafs on this road trip was they got some secondary scoring. Yeah. They got some guys scoring. When Austin Matthews doesn't have it, someone else steps up, and they're going to need that to be successful. Speaking of media heat and pressure, if nights like that continue for Edmonton, where it's, it's Connor McDavid doesn't get any points and no one really else is stepping up, the heat on Ken Holland to do something closer to February 24th. He, he's in a similar spot to that, yeah. too, right, where a bunch of people are saying, here's what's happened in the past. And he goes, whoa, whoa, that's not me. And the noise is growing along, along yeah. the theme that we kind of talked about today. That noise is growing. Ken Holland is a season vet, I and understand. Tip it, both and tip it. Does, and does Ken get wavered by that at all? Do you think no. in a market like that? No, Ken's going to say August 1st, 2019, or whatever his date was announced. Right. You, my report card starts on that date. It doesn't start the last five years when the team missed the playoffs or made the playoffs once in five years. His report card starts the day he got off the plane in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. And he's a real season vet. He's never worked in Canada before, so this will be new for him. But he's a real season vet. He'd be the last guy to listen to the the white noise. And Detroit's pretty damn close. Like, if you were going to pick an American Those guys all got five-year deals, too. You know what I mean? Like, they got... Their ownership is invested in the coach and the GM there. They're going to get time. Right. Um, Go ahead, Tim. No, I was just just thinking about how that market's been said, you know, a lot of people have said to them, have patience, and they're sick of the patience, but you kind of sort of have to because there's no other way to go in Edmonton when you're up against the cap and you're trying to get better. And these other teams are selfish. They scout you. They try to beat you. Yeah. They try to win the games you play against them. It's really unfair. (laughs) It's crazy. (laughs) Yeah. Insane. So you're trying to get better. Yeah. Everyone around you is trying to do the same thing. And some of them have gone through those tough years and are coming out of it. And I'll look at St. Louis. They didn't win a bloody thing for 20 years, yeah. 52 years. Right. And now all of a sudden, they got a machine. They got a wagon right now. So you're Edmonton and you're playing them. And Edmonton played a fairly good game against them. But guess what? They played a better team that played better. And they lost despite superb goaltending. 